Good morning, brothers and sisters. It has been a while uh, since I've seen some of you, and for those that don't know, I was away for paternity leave. Um, maybe I need to introduce myself. Um, I am Pastor Gabriel. I am the children and youth uh, pastor, for some who haven't met me yet. And as part of my role, it's to take care of our children and youth, and as a part of my family role, it's it's to, to raise a child. And so you see where the two overlap. I had it to produce uh, in order for our Young Life ministry to grow. No, just joking. Um, so I'm very thrilled. Yeah, that's, that's, that's who I am. That's what kind of humor you have to look forward to. Um, so I'm very glad to be back. It has been, it has been a whirlwind of many different things, you know, um, many different emotions. And so Jill and I are very thankful for your prayers and how you have uh, checked in on us um, you know, just with an encouraging text message or, or dropping some, some care good items off. And, and we just felt so loved and cared for uh, by, by many of you. And after all these things, I think I, I came into this having a great appreciation uh, for parents. Um, now I have an even greater appreciation for parents and, and diapers that can hold in their contents. I have seen some things, guys. I have seen some things. Okay. All that to say, let us, let us pray and let's invite uh, the, the word of the Lord uh, to speak to us. Our Father in heaven, great and holy is your name. Your ways are perfect and your ways are sure. Lord, we pray for an invitation to, to hear from you, Lord. We know that you are already speaking, but we pray that we would tap into just your specific ministry for us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this morning, um, we're stepping into Mark chapter 13. And as someone who works with, with children, I, I was, so, I was so, so, so struck by how the disciples talked about um, what they were seeing at the time. So in our passage, as Mindy read, if you're not there yet, we're in Mark chapter 13, and we'll be taking a look at the first 13 verses. As Jesus and, his, Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple, one of his disciples marveled at how wonderful the stones were, how magnificent the buildings were. I took a look in the NIV, an in, in alternate translation, and, and some of the excitement is much more palpable. In the NIV, it translates to, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. This is what the disciples said as they marveled at what was before them. What massive stones. It's like when we would go to the zoo and we would see, wow, what big animals, or, or wow, how, how tall is that giraffe? And so what we see is this, this, this almost boyish enthusiasm for what was in front of them. It's not often that we see people in the Scriptures talking about how big something is. And so when I first read that, I thought, oh, I mean, how, how big could it really be? Uh, if you could show the slide, please. And so here's a, um, a model or a replica of what the temple would have looked like in the city of Jerusalem. In case it's not clear, uh, the temple is that... that that rectangular, that area that's cordoned off in the very front. This is the temple, and the rest is the city, as you can tell, and this is to scale. And it shows us just how central temple and, and the worship of God would have been in Jerusalem and to the people near and far. The stones themselves were enormous, measuring um, over 60 foot in length easily weighing over a million pounds. And so these were the stones themselves. When the disciples say what marvelous stones, what massive stones, it takes huge stones to build something like this. And so the magnitude, the, the, the grandeur, the opulence that this temple would have been would have been one of the marvels of the ancient world. It exceeded any temple of its sort. It was a world wonder at the time. And in Jesus' day, this temple had been under construction for 50 years, and it, and it was unfinished at the time. 
For those that know the King Herod, or, or Herod the Great as he's remembered um, in, in the history books, was obsessed with grandeur and making a name for himself. The name Herod the Great is actually a title he gave himself. And, and when you're the first Herod, you're, you're, I guess you're allowed to do that. And so he was obsessed with making himself known and great. And so he greatly enlarged the temple where it had originally stood on 17 acres. That was how big this temple had been. Herod expanded it by um, quite a bit, by 20 acres. It became 36 acres by the time um, Herod was, was working on it. For some, that's, that scale is hard to imagine. Our church property itself is about four acres. Um, some of the commentators in the Bible said that this, this uh, 36, 35-acre area could fit 12 football fields. I know we don't do a lot of football, or maybe not as many of us are interested. This can hold three Rogers centers, if that makes any sense to you. The Rogers Center, where the Blue Jays play, holds 50,000 people. And so this space, if you, if it, hopefully you're able to understand, this space is massive. Hundreds of thousands of people would have been present and giving sacrifices at this time. This, what, this temple was the hub of activity for Jewish life and for worship. For thousands of years, sacrifices were offered daily People would be present daily, and for three times a year, the Jews would make an annual, or I guess a, a, a pilgrimage three times a year, to the temple to offer their sacrifices. And so you can understand, not only to, to King Herod at the time, but to the Jews, this was a source of pride, but it was also foundational to their worship of God. Because it signified two things. It signified God's rule over them, and God's presence with them. We have to, to fully appreciate what the temple represents to the people. We're going to walk, take a quick walk through biblical history to see what that had looked like. From the very beginning, God has meant to dwell with his people. That's always been his intention. In the very beginning in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, God walks and talks with Adam and Eve. He dwells with them. It's, and because of sin, they're, they're launched out of the Garden of Eden and, and, and into the world. But that was God's intention, to be with his people. And then when the Israelites were in the wilderness, if you recall, the God of um, Yahweh led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He gave them these instructions to build a tabernacle, a place of worship, which literally meant a dwelling place, this tabernacle that they could pack up and, and set up every time they, they moved camp. And what would happen was the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud would rest on top of this tent, this tabernacle, and it would represent and signify to any Israelite looking in that direction, that's where the presence of God resides his presence is with us, and his rule is over us. Finally, when, the, when Israel became a nation, King David desired to build a permanent place of worship for the Lord. And so God, God, did, not, God did not permit David to build it, but he allowed his son, King Solomon, to build the temple. And the temple was grand and, and, and opulent as well in Solomon's day. The insides of the temple were covered, were, 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 were covered with these beautiful engravings of nature. God's desire was to, to remind them of this intimate presence that he held with his people in the Garden of Eden. So this temple, the tabernacle, all of it was pointing back to the beginning, this intimate dwelling and presence of God with his people. This is what it represented for hundreds, thousand years, many years. This is what the people would have been proud of and their faith would have been founded on. But as we would look through the Old Testament and, and leading up to, to our readings in the New Testament, we see that the temple, while of great importance by the, the time the minor prophets, the prophets talk about how this had become hopelessly corrupt. When Jesus steps on the scene, 
It had already become a place where merchants were profiting off of others by gouging the prices for these necessities of temple worship. Jesus, um, God instructed his people to offer sacrifices regularly and daily. And hopeful entrepreneurs thought, well, this is where I'm going to make a killing. This is where I'm going to profit off of people. And so they would make so much money. And we know that as Jesus came through, through the temple, on two occasions at least, he cleansed the temple. He turned over tables. In one occasion, he fashioned um, out of cords a whip. He was angry and frustrated with what he had seen, and he called the temple a den of thieves. And here, in our passage today, as the disciples sit, as the disciples marvel at this opulence, that they marvel at the beautiful structure of worship, they sit on the Mount of Olives looking over this temple, and Jesus explains to them, what you see here, everything that you associate with this temple is about to be destroyed. For them that were familiar with Scripture, perhaps they would have been reminded of, of a prophecy in Ezekiel where the presence of God leaves the temple and rests on the Mount of Olives as the presence of God watches. This was what was about to happen. God's presence was about to be removed from, from the temple. And, and the disciples, they would have made some association with Perhaps this destruction of the temple would be the very beginning of Jesus' coming at the end of age. The destruction of this temple would mark the end of days, the end times, doomsday. And so they ask him, Jesus, can you give us a sign of when these things are about to happen? There are times in Scripture where Jesus, where the Pharisees ask, give us a sign, and Jesus rebukes them. But even though they ask for a sign here, there's no such rebuke. Jesus meets them for what they're asking. And he goes on in chapter 13 to explain what these, these end of days will look like or what's to come. The temple would be destroyed in their lifetime, and then there would be a gap. He doesn't specify how long. This gap between his second coming, his return, and so what we have in chapter 13 that we're going to take a look at today, and, and Pastor Ken will take a look at it the next few weeks, is a collection of Jesus' prophecies and warnings for the days to come. Some of which, as we stand in history, some of these prophecies have already been fulfilled. For instance, the temple had already been destroyed. But all throughout chapter 13, Jesus' word is very specific. And so if you're going to forget anything that we cover today, remember this. In the end times, Jesus says, be on guard. Be ready and on guard. And so as per Jesus' prophecy, the temple was destroyed around 40 years later in 70 AD. And Jesus, as he specifies in verse 2, that not one stone would be left of this great monument. In 70 AD, the Jews warred against the Roman Empire, a definite lost cause. As the Romans sieged the Jews, uh, Jerusalem, eventually Jerusalem fell. And just as Jesus said, each of the stones of the temple were burned and raised down. The Romans wanted to extract all the precious metals that were in the stones. And so this huge building, the walls that surrounded it leveled, just as Jesus had said. And so some of these things came to pass, and Jesus explained that during this time, many things would happen. There would be rumors of wars, there would be um, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes. All of this would take place 
And at the very end of our section of our passage today, Jesus explains that amidst all of these calamities and disasters, there would also be betrayal. In verse 12, if you take a look with me in Mark chapter 13, verse 12, it says, and brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Family members would turn on each other, In their society, the family unit was the most precious thing. Child delivering their parents, father delivering their children, brother delivering brother. Under God's new economy, these strongest ties in the biological family unit were were surpassed by the spiritual ties by those bound to the, by the blood of Christ. And so these betrayals existed as new family lines were drawn by the world. Believers, as you know, would face persecution and at times would be betrayed and given up by their own family members. A new family was forged with those who belonged to Christ. In Matthew chapter 24, there's a parallel account of what we read here in Mark chapter 13. In Matthew 24, he expands on on who these brothers are. Child, father, father against their children, but brother to brother. As we see in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 and 10, brother would betray brother is not just a biological brother betraying a biological brother. But brothers and sisters in the faith would turn away during these times. When persecution was too hard, when, the hate, when, when hardship was tough, when, when the ideals and the, the ideologies of Christianity were broken in their minds, brothers and sisters would turn away from the faith and would be sources of hatred and betrayal. This is a harrowing word. We understand family lines being drawn. We understand that there's a difference between what the Christian believes and what, you know, secular society believes. And we understand. But Jesus is saying, be careful also of the brothers and sisters or brothers and sisters whom were once in the faith with you who would give you up, who would, who would be sources of hatred and betrayal. And so why would they give them up? What's happening? What are these reasons that, that some are defecting from the faith during that time and, and during our time? Why is Jesus, or how come Jesus is warning them to be wary of those who would betray them? He says in verse 6, many will come in my name during this time. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And many will lead them astray. This I am is God's calling card, his namesake. It's how he chose to be identified in Exodus 3 in the burning bush. And again, Jesus identifies himself as the I am, as, as, as there are many I am statements in the, in the Gospel of John. Jesus, Jesus identifies he is God. But there would be many who followed Jesus who would make these same claims. They don't have the same authority to make these claims, but they would make these same claims that they were messianic, that they were prophets from God. What's what we have in front of us in Mark chapter 13, a lot of it is actually fulfilled in the reading of the book of Acts. We see in Acts chapter 5, for instance, in, 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 during this time, a man named Thutis boasted of, of various signs that he could perform, and he led many astray. In Acts chapter 21, we learn of an Egyptian who claimed to be a prophet or magician. Likewise, he, he, he succeeded in deceiving thousands of people to join him 
embarking into the wilderness to meet with God. Many more during the days of the early church claimed, made these same claims to be he or to be the messianic prophet that they had been waiting for. Many of them claimed to have this secret information or to have this, this news that came that was imparted from the Lord. Why do people stray off course? Why do thousands join someone who claims to be a prophet or a magician in the wilderness? Why do others join imposters and join these revolts? People who are led astray or off course. They obviously don't go because they think it's the wrong way. People are led astray and off course because they believe what's being offered is better than what they have. People are led astray because they believe what is offered there is better than what they already have. A better way of living, a better way of thinking. They believe the lie that the good news there is better than the good news of the gospel. People believe the lie that the good news there is better than the good news of the gospel. They believe it's a better gospel. You see, Satan's schemes are insidious and subtle. In our day, in 2024, in our society, it's not going to be someone claiming to be the Messiah. I think many of us would say that person is deluded, that person has a God complex, that person is so obviously mistaken and needs help. Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 6 that Satan has his hand in the principalities and the authorities in the way that our world thinks and operates. And so what is, being, what is leading people astray in our days is not what led people astray then. It is not someone claiming to know truth, but it is similarly its ideologies and it's this promise of a better gospel, of better news. For a while, our society was built on, for a while our society stood on the principles of the tenets of our Christian faith. Much, much of Western culture was built on that. And then there was a shift to postmodernity where it became things were relative. You know, what's right for you is right for you, and we can agree to disagree. And it was harmonious in this imperfect way. What's right for you is right for you. And there was this framework where it was okay, we would agree to disagree. Uh, recently, I was, um, I was fortunate to go to, to this talk that our, our district, our district in, in the Alliance put on, and um, one of the district superintendents, Mark Peters, he shared this about the changing tides of, of Western thought. If I can have the slide, please. I'll read it for us. This is what Mark Peters, the district superintendent, says of uh, the Pacific Canadian District. Personal freedom has become the highest value in Western culture, and along with it, an insistence that being true to oneself is only possible if we are free from outside influences. The assumption is that maximizing individual freedom and expanding the available choices is the path to satisfaction and self-fulfillment. Our culture operates by the following two principles. One, I should be free to do what I want as long as I don't harm you. And number two, you are not free to question or limit my choices and behavior. This is the better gospel, the better good news of our day. These two principles make a lot of sense if you've been paying attention. Right? I should be free to do whatever I want as long as I don't harm you. I guess that's the old narrative, the old, the old paradigm of we can agree to disagree. But this second point is very important to us. You are not free to question or limit my choices and behavior. You need to stay in your lane. 
This is the thinking that dominates secular mindset. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because when I saw this, when I, was, when I read this on screen, when I was hearing him talk about this, it made sense that this is the culture that we are embedded in right now, that the person true to oneself has become the central figure for decision-making. In the scriptures, only God can with all authority actually say, I am he. But in our society today, we are all told that we all have that same authority to say, I am he, I am she, I am the one who, ha- who makes the final decision. What I want is what I'm entitled to. That is my right, my human right. And so in our day, I am he is not someone who is deluded with a Messiah complex. It's all of us. And this is what our society propagates and lifts up and says, this is the gospel, the better gospel. You are you are the authority of your life, and no one, nothing can tell you outside of that. And so what we have on the other end, society telling us, You can choose what's permissible as long as it doesn't harm anyone else. You can choose what is the greatest good for yourself. If you identify to be something, if you identify to be this pulpit, that's fine. If you identify to be uh, an animal, that's okay. If you identify to be fill in the blank, that is your right. You are And so the scriptures are thrown out because they don't place the individual person at the center, but they place a holy God. The scriptures, let me repeat that, the scriptures are thrown out because the person is not at the center, but a holy God. And it's not just our secular society that struggles with this, but Christians are buying into their own experiences and their own worldview as having a greater authority than Scripture. Think about this. When you are at at this tension point, when you feel the world works a certain way or celebrates certain things that are at odds with Scripture, where do you stand? At these tension points between what the world celebrates and what Scripture says, where do you stand with the world and your world view of what should be right? Or do you align yourselves with the Scriptures, the God of the Scriptures? See, seeing what appears to be this incongruence between the world and what's said in Scripture, some Christians have turned to this this. this idea, this ideology that's called deconstruction or tearing down their faith. At the most extreme form, now there's many ways to to look at deconstruction, but at its most extreme form, deconstruction is a critical questioning of traditional Christian beliefs, such as Jesus as the Son of God or his death being necessary for the forgiveness of sins. And in deconstruction, it's often refusing to recognize the authorities that are perceived as having privileged positions. Um, People in the church, for instance, who, who supposedly speak for God. And so when the person is at the center of the world, then deconstruction follows. When I am he, and I or I am she, when you are God, then you can, you are, you are at, you can decide what is and what isn't gospel. Over the years, I have talked to many different people, uh, many that I grew up with in the church, many that I served with as leaders. People have many different reasons to walk away from the Christian faith. People have many different reasons to be led astray. But there are two that, that keep coming up. Chief among these are hurts from the church, church leadership, the way the church works, 
And number two is their inability to reconcile what they see in the world with what they think of God in the Scriptures. In their dissent, many who deconstruct very extremely tear down their faith, pointing to the faults of church leaders, pointing to how the, the Bible is archaic and the ways are too old school for our time in 2024, that they're bigoted, narrow-minded, that it just doesn't fly anymore. And in doing so, many who deconstruct lead to their deconversion, leads to this complete falling away from the Lord. And this is a real thing that we, in the Western culture, in our society, this is what Christians are up against right now. And the reality is, if you've been in the church for a while, whatever that means to you, you will begin to see the imperfections and you will gather a number, you will receive a number of hurts. But let me tell you this, deconstruction that is anti-authority of the church, that is anti-authority of the scriptures, that places your opinion and your worldview and your life's experience as the central operating, the, the central figure of operations, then that only leads to bitterness and hatred of God. Deconstruction that is anti-authority of the church and of the scriptures leads to bitterness and hatred of God. If your worldview is based on your lived experience and what others have done against you, there is nothing that is going to lead you to reconciliation with the church or with God. But if your deconstruction if your evaluation of your faith desires to be in a restored relationship with the God of the Scriptures, then it can be helpful to parse out what was harmful in one's faith journey. For instance, myself, I, I looked at how church had worked in my understanding. I looked at what governed how certain things worked in church. There were cultural pieces, Canadian culture. For me, I grew up here, Chinese culture. There was the way that my family culture was also part of it. And, I, and, and, and when I was many years ago, and I thought, the church doesn't work. I don't know if organized religion, no, not organized religion. I don't know if denominations work. Why can't we just love each other? And it was there that I began to think about, well, well what doesn't work? What, what is scriptural and what is cultural? I'm Chinese, and there are many things in Chinese culture that overlap with scriptural, scripture principles. Honor your family, love one another, But there are certain things in Chinese culture that are not, that, it, that I should say, in my own culture, that are not scriptural. Chinese, in my culture, it says that I need to, to make sure my bank account looks a certain way so that my family is well taken care of. In the scriptures, it says, give it, a, give it away. In my culture, it says that it's best not to take risks. It's best to stay in your comfort zone. But the scripture says, pick up your cross and follow me. And so what I went through, I probably wouldn't use the word deconstruction, but what I went through was this reforming or a reformation of what I needed to see as scriptural and part of the God that I had encountered for myself and what was brokenness and things that weren't part of God's gospel that I needed to give to him and redeem. Because it's when we come, when we evaluate, tear down, 
deconstruct, reform, whatever word you want to use. When we do that, when we desire to get back with the God who is in the scriptures, who tells us he is loving, who tells us he is kind, when we stake our life on the scriptures, then only God can bring true redemption to the hurts and broken parts of our life. When we try to find that in man-made ideologies that tell us, you are king, you are God. When we try to find that in anything that is outside of God, it leads to bitterness, resentment, hatred. It doesn't lead to restoration, friends. Over the last three months, um, there have been a lot of feedings that I have to do with my daughter. And, and after she feeds, um, I sit her up. And because she, she's very sensitive to throwing up, we sit her up for about 20 minutes. And for 20 minutes, at first I would think about other things. I would, you know, maybe I would browse my phone. But in the middle of the night when it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., just don't even really want to put my phone on, just, just kind of sitting there in the dark. And for these three months, God has been placing the names of people who have walked away from the faith in my heart. People who I served with, people that I'd grown up with in the faith, people who had been led astray And every day, I pray. I pray for you. And I pray for them. I understand, Christian, I understand, brother and sister, that... I should finish. And the reason I pray is because I believe that it's the God of the Scriptures that it's the God of the Bible who can bring true healing, true restoration to these broken pieces that we're trying to figure out. The Christian and brother and sister that you have real, I understand you have real hurts and you have real struggles, both in the church and you have struggles with what it looks like to live out your faith in the world where even talking about what the Bible says could be, could be seen as hate speech or bigoted. And I don't want to dismiss your real hurts and your real heartbreak because I know how deep those pains are. My question to you today is, what is your starting point? What is your starting point? Have you bought into this worldview that you know what's best? That you are the one that's going to figure it out based on your experiences? Or, Will you fall into the loving arms of the all good and gracious God of the scriptures? What is your starting point? Because some of you are at an inflection point. And so to you I say, don't lose heart. As we sang in one of our worship songs today, Ancient of Days, trust in the Lord who is the ancient of days, who knows the beginning and the end. Trust in the Lord whose grace, whose all-sufficient grace is there for you. He can redeem any of your hurts, any of your broken experiences, any of your marred images of who he is or who the church is. He can redeem anything. There is no hurt, there is no healing that he can't do. You are not better off on your own. And so today, to be on guard in our day and age is to know the God of the Scriptures, to hold on to the truths that He's given when we face hardship. To be on guard is to walk with one another in the faith. To be on guard is to see that your brother or sister is struggling with what they believe, struggling to live as a Christian in this world. If I were walking by a, a swimming pool and I saw somebody struggling to stay afloat, I think we would make every effort to save them, 
For those of you that can swim, you jump into the water and, and try to pull out this person who's, who's struggling, who's drowning. Or perhaps you, for those that can't swim, at least from the side, you might throw in a flotation device, a life preserver. You might run to get help from a lifeguard. So all the more if you see some of your brothers and sisters here that are floundering in their faith, struggling with living a compromised Christian life, all the more we should get in the water or call on the God of the universe to help them. It is not a hopeless endeavor even as people are reforming, rethinking, reevaluating their Christian walk. We've deviated from this, but to tie this in Mark 13, brick by brick, the temple was destroyed. Brick by brick, what represented their way of worship for thousands of years leveled to the ground. And it wasn't because God had given up on the corrupted worship of his people, but because his plan was being fully realized. Our God is in the business of redeeming and restoring things as he intends. God's intention from Genesis to Revelation is to dwell with his people, to dwell with you and me. The destruction of the temple was not the end of worship of God because although those bricks had been leveled and laid to waste, God's plan for a new kingdom was unfolding. Jesus, the indwelt person, the indwelt God was living in their midst. And the stones of the new temple of God would not be made from bricks and mortar but be made up of believers. Peter explains, if I can have the quote, Peter explains in 1 Peter chapter 2, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. To you who are in Christ, you are a living stone, you are a living stone of the temple of God. And collectively, brothers and sisters, we serve as a dwelling place for the Lord. The physical temple was destroyed. And if you flip all the way to Revelation chapter 21, a physical temple is not coming back. Because what was built in its place is far more beautiful than anything humanity could ever build or conjure up. Church, we are the living stones of the temple of the holy God. Because the God of the universe would take his dwelling in believers. God's tabernacking, indwelt presence was meant to be shared and meant to move. It's not meant to be fixed in one place. If God can tear down or break down what was so meaningful, what was so purposeful, but was only just a shadow of what he fully intended, to some of you that are evaluating, deconstructing, looking at those fine parts of your faith, and you're thinking, the God of the Bible doesn't fit my life anymore. Perhaps this is part of a beautiful picture of his construction of something new that he is doing in your life. But the parameters have to be within the scriptures and not yourself guiding this process. In front of us, we have a passage that talks about the signs of the end of age. In, in verses 6 through 9, much of it would come to pass in the book of Acts. Wars, believers tried and delivered to government officials, beaten and tortured. 
kingdoms would rise and fall. We talk about the strength of the Roman Empire. That would be raised. Something else would come to pass. For a while, we talked about postmodernity and, and how everything was relativistic. We have a new thing now. And it too, whatever this new term is, will come to pass where, where, per, where people are king. If you want to see how people, if you want to see how brothers and sisters, Christians lived it out, then read through the book of Acts and you will see. Because in the midst of all of these hardships, at the midst of all of these earthquakes, famines, scary times that are ahead, couched in this, and it's no mistake, is verse 10. After talking about famines, earthquakes, warring nations, believers being led astray, God, God says, Jesus says in verse 10, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. It's no mistake that this evangelistic vision is couched in verses talking about suffering of the church and talking about this new living stones that are no longer fixed in Jerusalem, but it is adaptable. Good biblical theology, are, Christians with good biblical theology are ones that know how to meet culture where they are, not ones who hole up in their own temples in an old Jerusalem. Amidst all of this hardship is the church on the move. As the early church was persecuted, as we see in Acts, it explodes in its growth. And as the church is persecuted, the message of the gospel is prominently placed before governors, councils, and kings. I mean, Paul met with Caesar during this time of the Roman Empire. The gospel was on full display. And so while many more detested the Christians, detested the way, there are many more who came to faith as they were exposed and they saw men and women who were willing to die for what they believed in. The persecution of the church, of the early church in the book of Acts, caused the gospel to spread like wildfire. And we see this today, where Christians that are heavily persecuted in nations, where, where men and women need to, to, to practice their faith in underground churches, they are faced with real lordship questions. Not just, do you want Jesus to be your savior, but will you have him as lord and master of your life? There, the church booms and it explodes because these men and women, they get it. They get what's at stake. And so what's happening for us is, as Jesus describes, is the beginning of birth pains. There's going to be wave and wave and wave of suffering to come. Some of the things that we have built our foundation on in Western civilization, Western culture, these pillars are coming down because more suffering is coming. But do not be afraid. Be on guard. With every birth pain, with every more intense wave of suffering, new life is coming. At the end of birth pains is new birth. At the end of suffering, calamities, new life. This is only the beginning. Beginning of what? Beginning of new life. God is able to take any bad circumstance, any marred image of what real, worship, real authentic worship looks like, and he's able to redeem it. And as we see in the Acts, in the book of Acts, as, as, as men and women are brought before kings and councils and, and governors, God says that he would give them the words to speak in order, what? To testify about who he is. 
If the God of the Scriptures cares about their testimony to others, how much more will He testify for Himself in our hearts? If God is going to give them the words they need to speak to testify for Him, how much more will He speak the words of life to us who are in need of it? So do not go searching for truth in a society that tells you, you are king, you are God. Dive into the Holy Scriptures that tells us what a good and perfect and holy God looks like. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, you know what the future holds. And your future is this beautiful picture of us, the church, worshiping you in eternity. God, I pray for us as church to be on guard. There's going to be more waves of suffering to come. It is the beginning of our birth pains. Help us, Lord, to hold fast, to hold tightly to who you have revealed yourself to be in the scriptures. We don't want to be tossed to and fro by the ideologies or the, the what is su supposed to be the better news of our day. Help us to hold tightly to your gospel truth and to share this with a broken and hurting world who is not in need of living better lives for themselves, but is in, better, is in need of your gospel truth. We pray in thanks for who you are, what you've done, what you are already doing, and inviting some of us to this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.